up, everyone? This is Peter Neal from GSP REI, and you're listening to the Real Estate Investing On Point podcast. This podcast is designed to help both active and passive real estate investors take their real estate investing game to the next level so that you can grow a successful real estate investing business or find out what to look for when you're investing passively in a real estate investment business. Let's get right into it. All right. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Investing On Point podcast. I'm here with my partners, Ron Lockhart and Wade Carroll. Gentlemen, how are you feeling today? A little tired. <laughs> so we're recording this. So I think we're a week early. This will probably launch next uh, next week sometime. So we just came off of the Thanksgiving holiday long weekend I talked to both of you about it, but let's let's talk about it on the podcast. Ron, how was your time? You spent some time with your mom and the family, and what was it like? It was good. I was down there with, uh, as you said, my mom, three of my kids, my wife, my, my one son who's in the military. He wasn't able to be there, but had three of them there and basically just uh, entertained them the whole time. So not, not very relaxing, but... <laughs> Always, uh, always enjoy spending time with my family. So it was good. Did you bring the dogs with you too, or was it the whole clan? Or brought, brought the one dog. Okay. Uh, what'd your son do? What do they do for Thanksgiving? They really don't do much of anything. They get turkey, so, or no? I think they like ordered takeout. To be honest with you. Gotcha. Gotcha. And they ate in the barracks. Gotcha. So what was what was your favorite uh, holiday side? Your mom's a good cook, right? I think you've told me this before. She is a good cook. I like uh, the sausage stuffing. Um, she makes a really <laughs> good homemade mac and cheese. Nice. Uh, everything was really good. Nice. Yeah. Wade, we talked about this uh, yesterday. I was surprised you weren't smoking turkeys for... Uh, thanksgiving but you you go a little bit of a different route so uh give us your your rundown and you were out of town for the uh for the holiday too right yeah we went to uh uh colorado uh, mount rose colorado where we grew up so my folks are there and two of my brothers are still there so gotcha yeah and i you know we used to always smoke a turkey <clears throat> have, have for years and uh I don't know, probably five or six years ago, it, um, beef tenderloin just is so much better. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we eventually scrapped the bird and opted for beef. So yeah, we we do, a, I think we did like 27 fillets. Oh, wow. Wow. For the whole family. Good night. And how, yes. how are you cooking those? Are you, you're not throwing them on a grill, are you? You're doing them in a pan? Oh, yeah. You throw them on the grill. Okay. Yeah. I I don't smoke tenderloin, but, uh, and I'm with, it's such a good piece of meat. I just salt and pepper, olive oil and hot, hot grill. Yeah. Yeah. I'll usually, so I was telling you this yesterday. I usually do that for either Christmas or new year. And, um, we're not, we don't have 27 with it. The family's not that big. So I'll usually, I'll do them in a, in a, like, a a uh, cast iron pan on the range and then I'll uh, finish them off in the oven. But I, same thing. It, it's just one, once, once you go beef tenderloin, you're, you're not going back. That's hard. What would you say your yeah. favorite side is? What, what, uh, if the meat is kind of the star of the show there, I'm sure. But, uh, what, what would you pick <clears throat> if you had to go with the sides? Yeah. My mother does, uh, uh, it's not a stuffing. We call it a dressing cause you're not actually stuffing it in the bird. Uh, it's a basically a cornbread dressing that we all grew up on. It's just fabulous. Yeah. And of course, you know, and then sweet potatoes and the green beans. It's hard to give any of them up. <laughs> I'm a big mashed potato guy myself. I mean, I, I, I love a good mashed potato. These the ones we had this year were were really good. Some are some batches are better than others. You know, if the, it's just the the potatoes are sometimes more potatoey than others or something like that. These ones were were really good. I'm also a stuffing guy. What we call it stuffing. I feel like Ron. I feel like people around here don't really use the term dressing too often, even though we don't stuff it in the bird either. Um, but we still call it. Oh, stuffing. you don't. 
Okay. No, no, my, my my mom's not into that. You know what I mean? With uh, what are they? They said it's not like very sanitary or something or something about that. I don't know. But I know when she was growing up, she'd say her father was always. Oh, that was his favorite part was the the stuffing in the bird. That was my dad's, and and you know to Wade's point earlier, he my dad that whole side of the family is from Arkansas, so. Oh. So we did call, and we also make cornbread stuffing, which yeah. I love. Um, so he would always like it in the bird, and he was the one, the one that always did that. When he passed away, we kind of got away from it, but it was the same thing, stuffing, dressing, you know, yeah. depending on which way it was, which way that was in or out. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had cornbread stuffing. It's good. I bet. I mean, I like cornbread. I like stuffing. I don't see why the two of them wouldn't. <laughs> wouldn't be good but um hmm. so uh now that the uh thanksgiving holiday season is is over or the holiday season is just beginning what uh what are you guys doing you're doing your christmas shopping and uh you, you do that early or late and and one other question i wanted to ask wade is did your mom make any candy for thanksgiving or what was the what was the situation there if for for yeah, the I'm... listener who doesn't know wade's mom makes the absolute best toffee in the world so w i'm sure you guys had some candy right oh yeah it was everywhere this is her busy season so she'd already sent out like 300 pounds uh before i even got there wow. but That's i did so get funny. my my christmas order in so uh you better how about your other how about your stuff? other christmas shopping what uh how are you usually uh you quick to do that your last minute what's that look like <clears throat> I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> oh, me? Uh, I like how he, I like how he sat back, like he was gonna take this question off or something. No, that was for you. <laughs> you know, I I, uh, I enjoy shopping for Christmas. Um, you going to stores? Out. You doing it online? You, you doing a combination? Usually, uh, usually I do it online. I have a I keep a list on my phone. You know, I have a whole pile of kids, so I I keep. I keep notes on what everyone could use or would want throughout the year. So I, it's easy. I just order them all online. I've not done so this year. We're kind of tied up until the fifth, but yeah. By the oh, and we'll seven, get to I'll that in a, in a second as well. Ron, what, what are you, I feel like you're probably a last minute guy. What are you doing your, your Christmas shopping yet? Or uh, are you getting ready? You making notes? Well, so my wife and I, this is pretty convenient. We basically just don't buy anything for each other, you know, because <laughs> with with kids ranging from 21 to four, uh, we've got enough on our plate. So, sure. you know, I actually do enjoy shopping for the kids, really the younger ones, because you never get tired of buying toys. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, the older ones make it pretty easy. They send us a list of what they want and. My, my my daughter is a little more complicated than my son but my my oldest son he says just give me cash and i'm fine so he makes it easy so he wants to go buy what he wants to buy sure so, you know we got the program down but, to, but no i'm not last minute when i do shop just <laughs> no, I, I, th I thought I'd you'd I'd like i thought you'd like that joke i appreciate it i try to plan you know <laughs> I I am that way. Like I, I, my issue is, is so if somebody's throwing out, um, kind of cues, you know, for what they want or something like that, I will, I'll just buy it. You know what I mean? Cause I know if I, if I don't, I'll probably forget about it or something like that. But then the issue is, is if I, once I have it, I can't wait till Christmas to, to give it to you. I mean, I, I had to give it to you when I have it. So usually by the time Christmas is rolled around, I have no more gifts for anybody. I've already, <laughs> I've given everybody all their gifts. Um, and we kind of as a family, we 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 like it in the sense that now you get to enjoy it, especially if it is like a like a Christmas, you know, ornament kind of thing or like a, you know, something you put on like the um, like a hutch or like a, a, what's it called, like over the fireplace or something like that. I mean, this way you can enjoy it, you know, during the whole season, that kind of thing. But, yeah, I always I get stuff and then I, I, I love I love giving gifts. So um, it's hard for me to sit on it and wait. What are you that's, guys asking? That, yeah. That's funny because I don't think I've ever received a gift from you. 
you, you received many gifts and, and many other uh, many other weed, ways. I've actually gotten gifts from him. Oh, you call me out. <laughs> live. Here we go. I'm writing this I, down. I have received coffee from Wade, you know, so he has given me gifts. Um not for me. We'll take we'll take this up off, yeah, okay. off the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about this after the show. The <laughs> I'm just making a making a note here not to forget it. The uh so actually it's funny you 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 bring that up because it leads right into my next question is what are you asking Santa for Christmas this year? Let's start with you, Ron. You smart Alec. Uh, like I said, my wife and I don't get each other or anything. So I, I, don't, I don't care, don't, but I don't I'm saying I, what are you asking I, Santa? What I, do you want? I ask for the joy of my company and or my family's company and my friends. Like, I thought know. well, that was what I was giving you each year. I thought that I, apparently that's not enough. So uh, yeah, I, I didn't know that was joyful, but <laughs> um what no, I I truly I I'm a big believer. I'm not like a, a want guy. It's like more if I need something, then I'll get it. Um you know, didn't know I wasn't it's always usually there. socks and underwear and stuff. Yeah, like I just, that. You know, I'm I'm pretty simplistic. You know, if I if I if I need something new for you know the golf game, you know, I'll go get it. Okay. That's about it. Okay. You know, fishing. If I need something new for fishing, I'll go get it. Yeah. You know, I'm not gonna wait till Christmas. <laughs> to your point, I want to be able to enjoy it. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. And too, it's like it's a silly if you ha if you do buy something to to sit on it and wait, you know what I mean? But what's the term uh Christmas Eddie? Do you guys ever hear that? My mom used to always say that. Like so when you're growing up, you get uh you get a, a shirt or a jacket or shoes or something and you want to wear it right away. My mom would call you a Christmas Eddie. I don't know where I'll have to ask her where she came yeah, up with that. that. Yeah, well, so the, it's <clears throat> well the other thing is you know, when you get stuff you don't want and then you gotta Act like you want it. You know, oh, this is great! I really enjoy. It. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you got to uh, you got to play the game. It's going to sit in my closet for the next two years. Mm -hmm. Sweet. What about you? What are you asking Santa for? I I think as we get older, we get we're we're become difficult. Uh, <laughs> Because like Ron, well, like I, for for my dad, I can take him. Like so, I, I'm a temple guy. My mom's a temple gal. My uh, dad's a temple guy. Like I can take my dad to a temple game, football, basketball, doesn't matter. I could take him to the store, get him a get him a shirt or a jacket or something, and he he's a happy guy. Um, so he's he's pretty easy when it comes to that. As he's gotten older, I think he's become easier. Uh, same with like the Eagles. You know, take him to an Eagles game or you know, take him to a Phillies game or something for um you know another that's holiday good, yeah it's a quick it's a quick easy you know he likes the experience and uh or you if you get him a shirt or something like that i mean he loves it so yeah i've i've seen my father give away christmas gifts within seconds of receiving it. <laughs> <laughs> no lie so he's more difficult there you go ron if you get something you don't like you just got to think of who you can give it to that's well, always the worst. It's your in-laws. They'll buy you a shirt. Like I, I'm not going to wear that. Like if I want a shirt, I'll go buy my own shirt. Sure. <laughs> you no, know, I. Yeah. It's like just don't. You have to. You have to find the shirt you want and send it to them. Yeah. Point it to them. Give Here's them, the give them some hands. Yeah. We exactly. Must. Here so it is. You, you were Circle going it. somewhere with as you get older, and then you got. Oh well, yeah. As you get older, if if I need something, I buy it. Yeah. So by the time I get to Christmas, it's not like, you know, when you're a kid and you're broke, you can't buy what you want or need. So you rely on Christmas <laughs> for those things. <laughs> As you get older, like I have a job. I If I need a shirt, I'll buy a shirt. That's a good point. I, yeah, um... I, I don't know. I'd probably take all the fun out of Christmas shopping for everyone. but <laughs> No, I, I, I Buy me a bottle with... of bourbon. That would <laughs> be you know, a good, good bottle of bourbon. You yeah. can put that to good use. Yes. <laughs> better tequila. One of the two. Oh, tequila. Tequila is probably better for you. But a good bottle. Either one. Good bottle of bourbon. Good bottle of tequila. Can't go wrong. There you go. I'm, I'm taking notes. The um. Oh uh, yeah. I'm good the same bottle. way. I, I, good, yeah, bottle. good bottle. Good. <laughs> we we underlined that twice. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm the same way. I haven't put together like a like a Christmas list or my parents they'll ask me, you know, I mean, what do you what do you want? I just I don't know. I mean, it's 
this is not, you know, like you guys said, it's, you have, so you need something along when it comes up, you get it. And you know, you're not really waiting for, for Christmas. Um, and like, yeah, the days of toys or games or anything like that is, is long over. So, um, I, I enjoy shopping for others. And now that my, my brother and his, uh, his wife have the baby, I've been getting a lot of toys for her and, uh, a lot of stuffed animals and books and, different uh different of these interactive toys and stuff and i got the dog too i always get the dog a ton of stuff she's got she's got everything she she took out a candy cane this giant candy cane the other day she was running around with it she loves like giant toys um she loves all toys really small big but um so yeah i always i'll get her stuff go to the store that kind of thing um, so Wade, you mentioned, uh, being kind of tied up till December 5th. And prior to the call, we were talking about how your due diligence is going on the, uh, Heckam trade with HUD right now. So why don't you give us a little update on that and, uh, how's that process going? Give us some, some insight there. Um, it's, it's going well. Um, we turned in our preliminary model this morning uh so I, there's 1500 loans being auctioned um we've diligenced about 1200 of them there's a few markets we are avoiding this year uh i will not say what they are yet in case anyone's watching <laughs> well you know what i was going to preface this with <coughs> this will probably launch after so the oh. fifth is when the bids are due so this okay. will this will launch after that. So it might be interesting, cool to give some forecast, and then we can go back and listen and see if you were right or wrong or that kind of stuff. And it's always desperate, uh, not knowing if you're going to win. Am I bidding too tight? Not tight enough? You know that sort of stuff. It's uh, it's difficult. But there's there's four hundred loans of the fifteen hundreds. There's there's four hundred in Florida, which there you know, Florida normally has a lot of heckums. That makes sense that they're doing reverse mortgage, a lot of retired folks and expensive homes in Florida. 400 is a lot though. <clears throat> and historically we've avoided Florida because it's so competitive. And I just didn't think it was worth chasing the margin. Um, so we, we would put our, our money elsewhere. This year we'll probably bid most of Florida. There's a few places we'll avoid, but we'll end up probably about 300, 350 Florida assets will bid. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> where we tweaked the model uh, last time, which was HVLS 2023, and it seemed to work. Uh, we're, we're, we're sticking with that same tweak. I got a little bit more edits to do, which I'll do over the weekend, but. I don't know. It's, it's different to predict, you know, it, it really comes down to the people who will do well. Well, let me qualify it. The people that will win more are, are those bidders that are the least concerned about interest rates. I would say that to their folly potentially. So I don't know, you know, if interest rates run up a lot, then, it'll be difficult to get rid of some of these properties. If we think they'll stay the same or decrease, then we're sitting on free money. So I don't know. You never know what everyone, the assumptions everyone else is making. Because hmm. I mean, it's easy to look at things like right now, this, this is what the environment is right now when we're bidding this, but you won't even own these until probably February. And by the time you liquidate them, especially if you're buying stuff in the Northeast, it's going to be late 2024, if not middle 2025. And what that environment looks like 18 months from now, you know, I mean, I still have stuff from, uh, yeah, we're 18 months on a bunch of stuff in New York that we haven't, you know, finished foreclosure. So, you know, that's a, a long time to be predicting. So... Was there a pretty heavy concentration in Northeast in this one? Well, this, yes, but 
there's not a single New York asset this time, which is surprising. Uh, there's a lot in Massachusetts. There's only one in Pennsylvania, and that's Philly, which is odd for as big a state as it is. A bunch in Massachusetts, a fair amount in Maryland. And we always bid Maryland, but we we don't win a lot because there's a couple big nonprofits that seem to beat us all the time. But we're bidding we're bidding Maryland, few in DC, 40 or so in Delaware, which is rare. You know, we we bought those nine in Delaware last time. Uh, but I haven't seen Delaware assets in years. So it's funny that there's a bunch of them now. And then there's probably 30 or so in Connecticut. So the whole Northeast portfolio is 234 assets. How about New Jersey? None. None. Wow. I, th I think they must do them by, well, it's, it can't even be by region, but it, it's weird that, like there's nothing in Texas this hmm. time. It's very strange. And then 400 in Florida. So I don't know. There's a 400 in the South, 388 in the North, 234 in the Northeast, only 135 in the West. And that is primarily Arizona and California. And then Florida is the largest pool with 402. So Wade, for for the listener, you said that the the interest rates are going to affect, you know, the the bid price. And somebody who's who doesn't care about interest rates is probably going to bid more than somebody who who is factoring in the interest rate environment. Um, in layman's terms, and I mean, what is the effect? So interest rates goes up, or, or versus interest rates go down. What's the effect? on the out sale or like, what is like, just uh, kind of explain what that effect of the interest rates are um, on a note situation like this. Yeah. And I'm being a little bit simplistic. There's obviously a lot of other assumptions everyone's making, but, but, but correct. Say it takes me, uh, you know, whatever, nine months to foreclose on something in Chicago. And so that's going to put us, you know, whatever, September, October, of next year and uh i'm buying that asset today let's say it's a hundred grand let's say that that's the value is a hundred thousand dollars but by late next year um interest rates are 10 or 11 so it's it's an affordability thing right okay and i guess maybe a hundred thousand dollar assets not a great example because th those lower end assets are less affected but if this was a four hundred thousand dollar property um and interest rates are now 10 or 11, it becomes less affordable. So we're already seeing assets over 400,000 in our own portfolio sit on the market longer versus things under you know, 200, we get multiple offers almost immediately. So there's still a lot of heat in the real estate market, which is good, but certainly as interest rates rise uh, on our exit, it becomes a less affordable purchase for our potential buyer. You know, assume, I mean, a lot of those things you're talking about are sub 200 are also more for a first time home buyer market where you go up over 400, you're moving out of that market. And a lot of the data lately has shown that the first time home buyer market's been extremely strong. You know, that hasn't really cooled off at all, even with the lack of supply. Yeah, I don't know if you guys saw before a little earlier today, I sent over an article. It was about. Um, Wall Street getting outbid by uh, home buyers. Did you, did you take a look at that article, or I did read it. It was. I thought that was pretty interesting. It was. Um, the... Is that the one you sent this morning? Yeah, it was just over. Here's the dog. I did not read it. What are you doing? She likes to break in during these. You saying mm. hi? What's up? You saying hi? She always finds it. Always finds a way in the room. Um, so what's your, I thought that was very interesting. It really, I, you know, I think so many people have completely villainized the wall street buyers, the invitation homes of the world, the, um, 
Tricons, American Homes for Rent, you know, institutions that own a thousand units plus uh, for driving up home prices and that kind of thing. And it's I think it was Freddie Mac maybe that did a study and they found that it was a lot of it was the supply at the end of the day. And I mean that you had a lot of people coming online, uh, a lot of first time home buyers coming online. You had people moving from uh, after covid and, you know, the, just the work environment changing and people, um, you know, looking for larger units, you know, a lot more space and stuff like that. So there were all these other factors that seemed to play into uh, low interest rates for there, uh, there as well, um, that seemed to play into why the housing prices rose. And it wasn't necessarily, you know, these Wall Street buyers coming in and, and outbidding everyone. And now it, it seems the tables of turn where even, you know, the, the home buyers are outbidding Wall Street. So, What's your take on that, Ryan? I feel like we've been talking about that for a while. Um, you know, the news sources kind of villainize those companies and and maybe in some markets, I mean, rightfully, and, uh, you know, d definitely I'm sure some markets, they drove up prices more than others. Um, but it seemed like oh, across the board, there were all these other factors. And, you know, one, <clears throat> the big thing that we keep talking about over and over again is just the supply issues at the end of the day. Well, there was a lot of layers to that article. Um... You know, a lot of it focuses on existing supply. And, you know, is to your point, you know, as you're moving through the pandemic, the market got more competitive. It was really Wall Street and home buyers just going up against one another. I mean, it was it was a combined effect. And you saw, you know, prices run up and the you know, Wall Street, you know, whereas somebody who's a home buyer that's purchasing a home and, you know, their time horizon is different than, you know, an investor's, you know, they could afford to pay up where it reaches a certain point for Wall Street and investors where the numbers start to not make sense. And the other thing the article talked a lot about was the majority of Wall Street's purchasing was in a pretty consolidated market. You know, it was like Atlanta, North Carolina, Texas. Then in some cases, like in one state, it was only in 11 zip codes. And I think 35% of the buying was focused on those markets. Um, yeah. You know, so the other interesting part of that was like the, the one study, you know, took you know, census data, right? And they were, but it was head of household. And the other thing it wasn't accounting for was there's a lot of other adults living in those households. So the numbers were actually skewed a bit. So you could really look at it two different ways. So they're saying home ownership went up, but when you're only looking at head of household and you may have four other adults living in there, because a lot of cases, and I know people that have done this in $2 million houses, they move multiple families into the homes. It wasn't just one family living there. So that data was skewed a little bit. And the other thing that is going to be interesting to see how it plays out, because I think this started happening, what well, started happening a long time ago, but in a more concentrated manner, the build the rent communities. So a lot of the big investors started focusing on the build the rent communities, which are in the development process now, a lot of them. And obviously, some of them are completed. But their focus started to shift, and they talk about that in the article. And also, the reason why they focus on those 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 markets is the price point of the home. You know, they tend to be a lower price point, first time home buyer. There are a lot of reasons why they were focused on those markets. Um, so, I think there's a lot of good stuff in there, and it and you can turn it around and look at it a few different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the, the one common theme throughout the whole article was, you know, you still have this massive lack of supply and that is the driver behind prices where being where they are. And I think I sent you an article yesterday. It was Case Schiller. Um, prices went up again. I mean, they're, they're not coming down on a nation across the board they may even, be in some and that market. kind of goes off of what wade was saying because even with the rates rising prices are just starting to pull back a little bit now and so it'll be even interesting it'll be even more interesting to see what happens with a little bit of a pullback but even with the rates going up to, to touch an eight at some point the prices were still going up 
Yeah. How much are you factoring that in, Weed? Oh, I mean, we're factoring it in. Um, I personally, and we've talked about this before. I, I, do, I don't believe. I, I believe it's politically unsavory for them to. I think the White House is going to be pressing the feds to do either nothing or push them down through this next election cycle. Now, to the extent, and we can debate this, uh, the Fed will listen to them or not, but usually there's a fair amount of political pressure that the White House can put on the feds. <clears throat> Well, there was a there was another article I saw and I didn't get to read, but the I, mean, I, I glanced at it, and it it part of it was or the headline was a new default cycle has started, um, and it's and I'm not talking about mortgage defaults per se. It's it's corporate debt. It's a lot of different things. So there's a lot of questions out there about whether the Fed did a waited too long but b did too much in a short period of time that they may have overcorrected because there is a a lag effect when you drive rates up in a short period of time you're not going to see the effect immediately now now right now data has started to show that it's moving in the other direction but it's yet to see how far it goes in the other direction i mean it could potentially cause a problem and, and there are economists out there that are saying that, that, you know, we may not see the full effect of the rate hikes, hikes for another six to 12 months, and they, they may be a little more um, burdensome than, than, than uh, the Fed or other economists uh, anticipated. So and then one of the the pieces that I saw did see in the article, you know, glancing through it because it's you know focusing more on the corporate side, is that corporate bankruptcies are up. So there is something happening there, you know, in this interest rate environment that is affecting, you know, corporate cor corporations. Um, so it's, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. Because that is going to have effect on on the rest of the economy and, and jobs and the labor market. Cool. <laughs> well, I think that that's a good point. And, uh, you know, maybe we maybe we stop it there. We talked about a bunch of uh, different topics and um, you know, maybe with uh with everybody getting caught up from the holiday and all, maybe we, we call it a day and uh, we pick this up next week. Works for me. What do you think? I'm we'll good. get Wade back to his due diligence. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll catch up next week. We should have a exciting episode. We could talk about um, how quickly do the, is their turnaround usually Wade? So if bids are due on the fifth, where, when do you think you'll hear something? It's weird. Uh, <clears throat> historically, it's about two or three days. You bid on a Tuesday and they tell you by Friday. Uh, last time they told us same day. Wow. I got a call from HUD within like four hours of bidding. Cool. So, well, um, it could be a very interesting episode next week then. So uh, awesome. Well, I appreciate your time, bad. gentlemen. <laughs> it's all predicated on the response from HUD. Mm hmm. Well, that will be, uh, we will wait in anticipation, but, um, we thank everybody for, uh, for joining us today and, uh, either listening to the podcast audio or joining us uh, on YouTube and watching this, uh, this happen in real time. And, uh, we, uh, we definitely appreciate you and, uh, hope you'll join us on the next one. So, Thank you, everybody. We will see you next week. There you have it. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Investing On Point podcast. Be sure to subscribe and join us live on one of our virtual meetups. You can find more information on our website at gsprei.com. That's gsprei.com. Thank you again, and God bless. We'll look forward to catching you on the next one.